Um, interpretive dance in the background. Hello, everyone. Um, we are going to talk about the Internet of Things, and hopefully by the end of it, there won't have to be double air quotes uh, involved. Uh, so I'm Mark Stanislav. Uh, Zach's drinking. So this is Zach Lanier. I'm Zach Lanier. I'm a senior security researcher with Duo. We do two-factor authentication and also sponsored source. <laughs> well, you said we had to talk about the company, so. Internet of Things. All right, we're moving really quick through this, don't worry. All right, so Internet of Things, um, a lot of you guys might have remembered or know or interact with M2M. Uh, definitely a relationship there to be had. M2M, something that you've probably done embedded security research for and similar for a long time. Uh, Internet of Things, for me, is like cloud computing. Seven or eight years ago, everyone was, cloud computing, no, we've done this before. Cloud computing, no one. And now everyone's like, oh, cloud computing, my cloud, my cloud infrastructure, my cloud services. Um, so I think Internet of Things is going to be the same way. We're going to be really cynical about the, calling it that and, and, and writing papers about that. And then in seven or eight years, it's going to be the normal thing. So uh, I say get over the semantic stuff and just let's do it. Uh, so Gartner and ABI, they have their own predictions on fuzzy numbers of giant deployments of Internet of Things. Uh, my definition of Internet of Things is a little bit probably uh, tighter than theirs is. But uh, if it's Internet enabled or, or meant to be Internet enabled and it's an embedded device, I'm just going to call that Internet of Things. It's a very simple way to go. And a lot of the problems we'll talk about today are under the guise of, of kind of that, that context. So a lot of people have probably probably seen or heard of you know, big consumer Internet of Things, like home automation, for instance. You have a lot of people who uh, Intel, Cisco, um, TrendNet, Belkin, uh, all these larger companies that have, have, have a pretty good uh, you know, foothold on the embedded market and home automation and uh, you know, subsequently IoT. Um, but like we've seen with a lot, of other, a lot of other things, anyone can make a thing and get $80,000 overnight to do it. Um, and that's what you know, places like Indiegogo and Kickstarter help, ha um, help those people do. So um, you know, there are sites like Postscapes and Wolfram Alpha um, that actually do track the growth um, upcoming, the growth of IoT devices, upcoming um, you know, IoT initiatives, projects like those that are, being on, uh, that are on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. So all these, these crowdfunding sites offer an alternative to the big guys, right? You know, anyone in their basement can um, 3D print a case for uh, the Arduino-enabled thing that they built that, you know, makes laser beams shoot out of your fireplace or something. Um, and you can control it with your, your mobile phone. Um, the problem that we are seeing and kind of what this will all culminate in um, is uh, these are not security-minded people. Uh, generally speaking, um, we have like an anecdote that we'll share later um, that it's very salient points. Um, but these are you know entrepreneurs. They they're, they're inventors. They're not security people. So they're they're rushing to market just like people did with I don't know mobile apps and mobile devices um, a few years ago. So um, they also won't understand um, why people want to break their stuff that was horribly insecure, and they don't have the budget or resources to you know, deal with um, incoming submission, vulnerability submissions. So this, this is my trademarked uh, line of insanity. And th so, so what, what, this, what we're getting to the point here is, it's not necessarily like scary risk, it's why the hell are we doing it? So IP cameras, even though they obviously have serious sim uh, security and privacy implications if they got, you know, uh, broken into or like we saw with TrendNet, we'll talk a little bit about uh, you know, huge, uh, a huge lack of privacy for customers out of the box. If we go to things like doorbells, okay, you might want to see like when someone rings a doorbell at your home on your mobile app, who it is from uh, you know, the red eye you're taking currently and your wife's at home with your kids. Like pretty reasonable, kind of weird, but you know, we'll go with it. Uh, door locks, convenience factor, sure, like horrible outcome factor, huge. Uh, now, that's not to say, again, like, like Lockatron, which is what's up there, that they're insecure, they're doing things wrong. It's just we have to think about what are the applications of, of these IoT devices and what is that risk versus convenience that we're willing to take, especially at a point where we're still at such a nascent level with a lot of these things. Platforms don't have standardization. We don't have a lot of um, you know, developers that know necessarily the security space like Zach brought up. And then we get to the point where we're at an egg tray that is uh, Wi-Fi enabled, that has, I think, some Bluetooth capabilities, and of course a mobile app, because you have to have a mobile app for your, your egg tray. And it's not because the egg tray 
is necessarily a privacy risk like an IP camera. It's that imagine you're the people that get your network owned because your office thought it would be cute to have a Wi-Fi enabled egg tray. And that is the point of compromise and trying to explain that to someone uh, above you. That, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about in the line of insanity. Brings a new meaning to, to shells. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know he was gonna do that, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what? Uh, hold on, sorry, drink. Um, so, <laughs> we've, we've so I don't know if, if, if already. <laughs> thanks. Six Great. Um, have, are any of you familiar with some of the devices that are listed up here, other than Arduino? That doesn't count because everyone has that, um, and Raspberry Pi. That doesn't count either because everyone has those too. <laughs> uh, anyway, so no, most notably the electric imp and Intel Quark, which are very, very, very cheap devices, um, very low, low cost, easy to program, easy to develop for. But each of these offers. Um, Unlimited possibilities. Um, I mean, these are these are kind of generally general purpose devices. But Electric Imp is an interesting one because you buy this thing, you create an account in their web-based IDE, and you don't need to worry about their proprietary operating system that runs on this on this um, on this device. You don't need to worry about how they deliver anything to the device. Um, you just need to write code, the application code for it, um, and then it you know uses AWS and sends messages over their secret magical message bus down to whatever electric imp enabled device there is. Um, but you know, it's, it's basically kind of software as a, you know, software as a service more or less, or cloudy thing um, that you can just stick into uh, you know, something this big and make it shoot laser beams out of your fireplace. So the, the barrier to entry is very low for people to start developing uh, IoT devices. And from, from a consumer point of view, uh, especially as, as we keep going down this road where we want a technology, but we may not be ready to pay the price of the first to market you know, vendors or the big name vendors, which, to, which isn't to say that the big name vendors are going to do security well, but there's a certain level of trust. You, you know their name. You know that they probably have a big team looking at this kind of stuff. So if you look at like the, sil, uh, the Philips Hue bulbs, which Philips Hue had some vulnerabilities that were reported. Uh, Natesh, who did the Tesla research, uh, he was one of the people that reported some vulns on that. But you look at that for 60 bucks, and then you look at the Insteon for 30, and then the Limitless LED for 23, and now it's a bit of a horse race for vendors at a price point. And if Philips, let's say Philips does do a, a good job going forward with, with the Hue security, imagine what sort of resources these small companies have to put into security. Probably none. Uh, they're probably using similar technologies to what we just showed on the last screen, but at the same time, there's not really a lot of reference implementations to do those well, and ultimately, they're going to rely on third-party vendors that you have to then trust their security as well. So there's a lot of, uh, you'll see uh, funny things coming up, but there's a, there's a lot of interconnectedness, not just from the devices themselves, but in order to support those devices, power them, um, let you use your, your mobile apps with them. They're, these companies are not just their own vendor. They are their own um, you know, they themselves are using three or four vendors just to give you what their service is. So uh, in terms of uh, going back to consumers and, and that last slide, I think it's important to know what's happening in terms of the government. So the FTC, uh, Andrew was speaking earlier for the keynote, um, the FTC has actually done a really, like one of the most direct jobs in any government implementation of, of trying to get their hands around a big problem I've ever seen. And uh, the FTC has gone to the lengths of uh, putting together an entire workshop uh, la uh, last year in November. They had a, uh, uh, one of their commissioners on a panel at CES about IoT. And then the biggest thing, I think, in my opinion, kind of a, a little bit of an opening salvo against, hey, if you're going to do IoT, you might want to think about security, where they came down on Trendnet very, very hard uh, in, in, in terms of 20 years of kind of mandated, you have to have a security program, you're gonna have bi-yearly audits, you can't use the word secure in your marketing materials. As you can imagine for a network device company, not being able to use secure is kind of a big deal. Uh, so while that, that doesn't seem like, oh man, they destroyed that company, the point of the FTC I don't think is just to destroy companies, I think the point of the FTC is to help companies do things well for their consumers. And that, there's probably not anyone in the room that would you know, disagree with that uh, hope. Uh, and then most recently, IOA, um, they did a great job with Belkin Wemo, some really impressive research, a lot of different areas covered in terms of vulnerabilities that were found, everything from uh, uh, GPG private keys with, with hard-coded passwords in the firmware uh, to XML entity injection, some other cool stuff. 
they worked with US CERT to try to get this process going and actually getting Belkin to remediate. So things are happening. Um, and as we think about kind of these, these upcoming slides, what does that look like in terms of we want cool stuff, but we also want it to be secure? Uh, so this slide is a really uh, bit of an eye chart of some research I did back in October and kind of my first foray into IoT. This was a device that I happened to buy, one day did an MAP scan of my network, saw some ports that made me feel bad like Telnet, and uh, started looking at this. And this is kind of the, 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 the summary version of all the vulnerabilities in all the components of this uh, IoT device. And that's just one device, right? And we're not going to have like one or, or two of these. We're going to have 10 of these on each. Each of us are going to have 10 of them. In a household of four, you have 40 of these things. This is just one device. And this is a reasonably reputable, reputable vendor sold in Apple stores and Best Buy and Amazon and Walmart. Like this isn't something I bought off like, you know, a Kickstarter special. And with all the vulnerabilities I found in this one implementation of an IoT device, uh, that, that kind of gave some early pause and kind of why I kept going down, going down this road. The Izon was basically like the web goat of IoT. <laughs> Um, so this is the, a slide that we use to describe um, the IoT ecosystem, back to Mark's point about how things are kind of dependent on all these interdependencies and building on other stacks, building on stacks, because it stacks all the way down. So we figured that spaghetti uh, was pretty good, but we had to doge it up. Um, so very, very service, much wow. Um, back to the kind of the crowdfunding point, just to give you uh, some context around um, successful campaigns that have come out of some of these uh, crowdfunding sites, and you might even recognize some of them. The, um, like the Wonder Bar, which is a, a, like a modular um, uh, system on chip for developing your own IoT stuff, came out of Dragon Innovation. Piper came out of Indiegogo. Uh, Twine and Cool Things and, I don't know, Knut, which is Knut, Nut? Nut. I don't know. Came out of Kickstarter. Um, Pinocchio, which we'll actually talk about a little bit later too. Um, these are all you know, two, two, three, maybe 10 person shops that yeah. managed to get 80 to $800,000 um, from these crowdfunding sites. And, you know, the next day ship these things out to, to who knows how many people. Um, and it's, it's still up in the air about whether or not, you know, security was on their design documentation at all. Um, but these are just a small smattering of some of the crowdfunding sites. They're actually, I think, since we m uh, made these slides, there I found like two or three other big uh, crowdfunding sites that also have numerous, um, you know, consumer IoT devices. So um, to talk about some of the challenges that you know these types of uh, vendors are facing, um, Mark, we'll start with this interesting tidbit. Sure. So uh, so if this then that is a really cool service. Basically, you can. Uh, kind of do workflows with your various IoT devices and platforms and services. So it's not just only uh, IoT related, but there's a heavy influence. So the Belkin stuff is in there, uh, Philips Hue, uh, a couple, you know, a couple other platforms that are related to IoT. And it's not that I, uh, if this and that's insecure or you know bad things are going to happen to them. But if you think about the fact that they support 80 platforms in this general space, if they got compromised, so like Heartbleed, right? Heartbleed. Uh, if this and that was one of the people that sent out an, sent out an email to me saying, "Hey, this is what we did for remediation of Heartbleed." Uh, imagine if someone did grab one of my sessions out of with Heartbleed uh, before I could get into it, log in as me, and then have access to tons of devices in my home and into your home. Yeah. Um, so, so it, it's interesting, it's fun, it's cool, but the risk versus convenience here is pretty, pretty obvious. Like you're, you're asking for a little bit of trouble for a, a, a negligible amount of automation, I don't know. Uh, but I think the interesting part to this is they're not gonna be the only people doing this. The, the vendors themselves are gonna be the people that are going to be pushing this interconnected stuff. Uh, I think Samsung just had a recent release about how to like merge in your oven and your dishwasher and your washing machine under their IoT platform to automate things and, and live your life through uh, iPad. So uh, it's not just if this and that, they're, not, they're, they're a cool company, it's just we have to think about what we're gonna get out of them versus what the risks are. So kind of breaking them down into categories, um, you know, the things that we, we looked at, uh, you know, our hardware security, software security, network security slash communications, we weren't really where, sure where to put that. Platform by which we mean kind of the, the supporting infrastructure on which those devices build, so AWS, um, you know, Linode or Google App Engine or whatever. Um, user awareness, which is pretty important. And then finally, um, actually handling uh, vulnerabilities or as we like to call it, why would anyone call my baby ugly? So um, 
you know, with hardware security, there a lot of these devices that are getting deployed are using generic system on chips or development boards that, um, you know, as Mark mentioned with the Eyes-On, have sometimes have like the same firmware already loaded on every single device. And it's, you know, the question is how, how often are those getting updated? What's the update path? How are they getting verified? Which is a little bit later. Um, but, you know, one, one, one over, overlooked errata in that SOC or that, um, that CPU's uh, errata guide like could be damning for a number of devices that may not actually have the, their same purpose. You know, a camera might be running the same SOC um, and, you know, microcode as, I don't know, whatever this weird orb thing is. Um, so, um, and these are all designed primarily for quick development. They don't take into account a lot of security features that we tra generally transparently take for granted every day on, you know, mobile devices. So things like trust zone, things like isolated execution and, and you know, hardware backed secure storage, those are just generally not present. And even if they are, they're certainly not being used. Um, so this is, and then there are things like, um, you know, uh, UART ports that are, Still, there, still present on production devices or you know JTAG headers that are just easily accessible. So, you know, uh, hardware hacking made easy, um, <clears throat> and uh, it, it really just boils down to what we said earlier, which is anyone can buy this thing, stick some code on it, and then sell it to anyone without having to understand uh, hardware security at all. So this was like the least common denominator, right? You buy a logic analyzer, you buy a bus pirate, you find UART headers, and you get a console. So instant. Instant awesome. Um, software security on oh, this looks really good up there. Um, a lot of the development environments, especially things like Electric Imp or some of these other, you know, you buy the thing, we provide the infrastructure, um, they don't really make security options clear. Um, you know, it's just sort of a, we're squeezing the balloon and putting the, the, the trust and, and, and validation components somewhere else. You don't need to worry about it. Um, and, and depending on what platform is actually chosen, it might actually limit what languages um, someone can use. And they don't necessarily have to be type safe, right? Um, the, uh, as I uh, put, like me write Python or whatever your language of choice is, pretty one day, or worse, C. And it's kind of like history repeating. And I don't know if it's very clear in this slide, maybe it is on the, the front monitor there. Um, th there's Contiki, which is a, an IoT, uh, an open source IoT operating system. Um, and just like looking through uh, someone's Contiki project that uh, was, I don't forget what it was, it was like an IPv6 stack or something that you could load if you wanted to support that. There were just all sorts of potentially dangerous functions, just rid I mean, just everywhere in this, this, this project. And, you know, things like HTTP server.c um, doing unbounded stir copies. I mean, that's never gone wrong, so it's probably okay. <laughs> you just don't have to learn how to write C. Um, you know, furthermore, the uh, platform that's chosen might lock the developer or the vendor into a given operating system. And they don't necessarily have to be like the Linux experts to, to, to actually deploy their code. Um, so, th and then there's things like Electric Imp, which are, you know, black box proprietary operating systems um, that we, we won't even have any insight into at this point. Um, and then, you know, go Google for Linux, Contiki, and Qnix, and plus CVE, and you'll probably find a bunch of stuff. So you know, this inherited attack surface and, and, and sort of like shared, shared bugs that arise from virtue of using like some outdated, busted Linux kernel um, might have some pretty damning effects for the thing that shoots laser beams out of your, your fireplace. So this, like the example that we have here is just on a, um, this is actually the GoPro, which is a, somewhat of a, a stretch, but there's like, you know, pretty much like no mitigations whatsoever in the web, in the Linux side of it which includes, you know, the web server that runs there. So, you know, simple mitigations basically don't exist. Um, and then, of course, like back to the kind of building on stacks on stacks, um, you know, the mobile applications that are being developed to manage and um, interact with these devices have, may have their own issues. So, you know, insecure storage, all of the, like, OWASP mobile top 10 risks things, you know, you go look that up. We don't want to enumerate all of them here. Um, but I think one of the things that Mark actually ran into was uh, when presenting something he found um, through a mobile app uh, to a developer or one of these IoT vendors. They were like, well, that, that wasn't in the mobile app interface. How did you find that? Um, and then to kind of make it a little bit worse, there's this company called Relayer, and we're not talking bad about them, but this is just a really funny example. Um, they, they, they tout that in 10 minutes or less, you can have your IoT device ready on you know, the hardware platforms they support and the corresponding mobile app. 
So it's like a WYSIWYG kind of wizard that lets you build your thing. And the example that someone gave, this was not even ours, was the You Got Poop app. So it actually is to monitor your baby's diaper if it's full or not. Um, <laughs> I'm not joking. So, um, you know, network security and communication security, uh, since all of these devices are probably Zigbee or Wi Fi or Bluetooth enabled, um, there are some interesting conditions there, and, you know, all your normal Wi Fi attack tools apply. But, you know, if the device itself is acting as an access point, if it's doing Wi Fi direct, um, think, you know, why, why bother if it's an AP? No one's going to connect to it. We don't need WPA. Um, you know, they, all the original, like, no-nos of plain text communications apply here. Um, and even if they do use things like SSL and TLS and aren't vulnerable to Heartbleed, um, they're not doing cert pinning. Um, firmware updates and downloads, we've noticed a lot of those go either over plain text HTTP or they fall back to plain text HTTP when they can't connect over SSL. And then they don't always verify that the firmware is actually integral. Um, and then, like Mark showed, out, uh, showed earlier, just stupid stuff listening that's not really necessary. Telnet, um, SSH on, um, you know, on, on well, the device, well. Well, tel so Telnet was necessary because on the Izon, they were actually catting out uh, firmware updates over Telnet from the mobile app to the device. That was their firmware upgrade process. So it was totally necessary. Oh. You, well, I stand corrected. You don't want all that overhead or anything, so. Um, FTP, and then this is a stretch, but kind of applies because of the, um, the presence of these services, but a lot of like shared, shared accounts for support, for updates. Um, and if they're not, you know, if it's not the same account across all of the devices, you know, it's probably like the same auth material, like the, uh, you know, a key that's sitting on, on the device that if you extract it from, um, from that one via like dumping firmware, you can now own everyone else's stuff. Um, and then, obviously, things like cell technology, which is an even lower barrier to entry now for these devices um, by virtue of a Sparky cell, which makes just you plug it into the thing and now you have GSM. So, um, you know, I'll defer to other people's GSM, tech, uh, GSM research. Um, but yeah, now you, now you introduce a whole new, uh, whole new attack surface and, or phone home capability. Um, another, like, IoT-esque thing that we found. Um, Sensor.net, if anyone's familiar with this, you, um, you can go to their portal and it'll pull all of your webcam photos up and like aggregate them in one, in one place so you can have like a, your own little security, home security monitoring system. And they do this by you giving them the FTP credentials to your, your camera and then they just pull them that way. Um, so, I mean, I'd, okay, trust us with your, trust us with your, your credentials. Um, and, you know, another example, back to the kind of the AP, like Wi-Fi wi stuff, um, the GoPro Wi-Fi remote, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with GoPro, but it operates in two modes, either mobile app mode um, or Wi-Fi remote control mode. When it's in Wi-Fi remote control mode, the little keychain remote acts as an AP and you pair it with the camera. Um, it's vulnerable to all sorts of the old, like, evil twin types of attacks and stuff. Um, you know, it prefers like a known BSSID kind of pattern, but um, you can just reconfigure it to pair with any remote. So the example is just uh, suppress the Wi-Fi remote, um, make the, you know, the camera pair with your, your fake, fake remote, and you can view whatever's on the, on the screen. Um, another kind of IoT example that I thought was really awesome, I did an assessment of a home automation gateway that a large um, utility provider was deploying, and like anyone, they went with like the, the people who gave them everything in one package for a really cheap price. So they went with this like white label company that um, takes these uh, you know commodity um, little Zigbee or Wi-Fi enabled um, uh, routers, puts their stuff on it, makes it talk to their cloud magic service, and uh, on the Zigbee side, turns your lights on and off, blows up your pool pump, things of that nature. Um, but it was it was this nice like I don't know culmination of everything that, that you, you shouldn't do. Um, so the, like, the, there, were XS, there was XSS, CSRF, uh, SQLi, everything like OWASP, Web 101 stuff in the cloud, the cloud interface or the magical cloud service. Um, the gateway itself, you know, these production devices still had UART headers exposed um, that you just dropped immediately into, um, you know, a, a, a console as root. Um, they had the same support account across all of the devices with the same hard-coded passwords, with the same key material. Um, and then on the other side, on the Zigbee side, 
Um, it was easy to like extract keys, replay uh, transactions, inject traffic, um, but you know that it was a cheap option, and it was probably uh, produced by someone in their basement. So we, yeah, yeah, we're we're to the point where uh, I think a lot of developers are if it if it talks like HTTP POST or something, it's now an API. Unfortunately, in terms of authentication or signing, you know, API requests and that kind of that gets lost somewhere in the tutorials on you know when you Google. So uh, a lot of these developers are are exposing APIs because they have a mobile app, for, let's say, and the mobile app wants to hit uh, this thing that you've had to reverse proxy out of your network to some service, and Everything just kind of culminates in you start sending um, basically unauthenticated requests that might just use your MAC address, for instance, for your embedded device, and have no SSL, which we saw with the Izon. All the API requests for the Izon were completely clear text, including to the point where they're using the API calls with an MD5 some version of your password as the secret token. So um, we. we the exposure of these APIs wouldn't be a big deal if 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 what the developers think is going to happen would, would actually happen, which is, oh, no one will ever know these APIs are here. You, you have a mobile app, you have that device, nothing could ever look between those two things, therefore these are now safe. Uh, OWASP, we, we talked about mobile top 10, but web top 10, all this is still completely valid, all input, you know, things that we were supposed to sanitize or parameterize queries or, you know, uh, basic things that you should do are, are obviously not happening and only are they not, uh, they aren't only not happening but they're happening in such a way where even uh, uh, some, of these, some of these talks this weekend, we were talking about iOS security like WebView and being able to do cross-site scripting in WebView. Developers don't think of these things. They don't think like web browser rules apply to mobile apps and then we get into this really, really uh, nasty nightmare. And then from a you know, cloud deployment standpoint for all this infrastructure, I've seen terrible things done with Amazon uh, S3 with hard-coded uh, API keys in mobile apps. I've seen terrible things done where you're, you're standing up uh, a couple EC2 instances, and you have no uh, encryption between these endpoints, or you have a uh, like a web root somewhere, and you forgot to actually like enable HT access, and now you have directory indexing, and so all these things that we're used to having happen now they're happening in droves because every single one of these embedded devices wants to have some cloud storage. They want to have an API. They want to have a mobile app, and they want to get from A to A to Z as quick as possible. And they're not going to take the time to hire experts in cloud infrastructure and mobile app development and web app development. And they're going to get there, but they're going to get there kind of uh, pretty quickly at the risk of all of us. So we talked about TrendNet a little bit. Uh, the TLDR on that is a, a hacker found that, hey, by the way, the CGI uh, thing running on this camera doesn't actually require authentication. Unfortunately, that CGI app was actually the viewing the camera app. So you would have to log into the camera to do anything, but if you wanted to look at the camera and see what the camera was seeing, you could just go to this URL and you would be logged, logged in to each of these cameras. So someone actually aggregate, aggregated 700 of these at once, put up a list of like Pastebin or whatever, uh, Wall Street Journal took notice, New York Times took notice, so on and so forth. Ultimately it culminated with FTC coming down, fi you know, uh, firestorm on them and Trinet looks pretty bad. Belkin, before the Belkin stuff IOA just did, there was also when UPnP blew up and everyone, everyone's UPnP devices were basically vulnerable, Belkin had the same thing apply to that. Uh, obviously in the case where it's a power uh, switch effectively, flipping that a couple like million times automatically could result in some des undesirable results for your you know, family's uh, lack of self-immolation. Um, the hue lighting system isn't quite as scary as that. Uh, you might change the color of my light bulb from red to green and that might bum me out, but uh, this was some, uh, go, going back to Nitesh, uh, effectively it was your MAC address was MD5 and that was your authorization token. So if you just did an ARP-A on your entire network co-tenancy with these, these Hue systems, you could just enumerate until you found an API request that came back positively and now you know that I'm an authenticated user with the Philips Hue system. Uh, Izon, tons and tons of terrible things happen with Izon. Luckily, they are all fixed that I'm aware of, so that's great. But um, yeah, unencrypted files in S3 buckets that had no IAM, they were all using one pair of a, uh, AWS credentials that may or may not have been hard coded, like I said, in that mobile app. Um, and just things like, again, no API security and on and on. One that we can't talk about quite yet, hopefully one day we'll uh, talk about this without redacted all over the place. But 
uh, effectively purchasing in-app credits for a IoT device that had a service layer to it. And they weren't, of course, they weren't actually uh, you know, doing anything but having clear text calls everywhere. But the cool part was they actually didn't validate that you actually bought the credits. You would, your phone would just send a post request with an integer to an endpoint. And it would really take you seriously with whatever you said. Um, it wasn't in the mobile interface, so why would you, why would you do that? Yeah. Uh, and then the Wemo stuff. Uh, the, if you haven't seen the IOActive Wemo stuff, they, I think they had like seven or eight CVs on, on that device alone, but uh, really, really cool stuff and, and terrifying all at the same time. So Heartbleed, yeah, we're relevant. We, we read the news. Um, so so in, in, in the, the context of Heartbleed, while yes, it was sexy that everyone was running this, this POC on endpoints that, by the way, is CFAA, but the reality for IoT is embedded devices all of these things, in a best case scenario, are running some sort of PKI you know, deployment, whether it's self-signed crap that someone has a, a root CA that they're managing internally, or it's you know, public CA, CA type stuff. But you have mobile apps that are speaking to dev uh, embedded devices, embedded devices speaking to services, services speaking to other services that you don't know about probably, and then of course developers hitting API endpoints that are hopefully encrypted. So that, that fabric of, of PKI, whether we like it or not, is really important when it comes to things like embedded devices, because when you're at that Starbucks checking your home IP camera, you probably don't want people checking it with you on the same network, uh, nor do you want them to get your credentials over that network and log in and check it whenever they want. The cool thing and the bad thing is we've actually seen really good response, I think, in terms of like a lot of the services you and I probably use all the time. You're, you've probably been inundated with emails in your inbox, like, here's our response to this CVE that you, could, you probably could just copy and paste like the first three sections and just put it in a new email and that, that would be your response as a vendor. Um, but the Chinese ODMs or people that are putting these products, uh, the, these platforms on the market, I don't think you're gonna be getting uh, an email from them the same way you're gonna get emails from some of your, your favorite services. So your devices, the, the infrastructure you're using that has certs that may have been compromised or uh, at the very least, some, some usernames and passwords that might have been you know, uh, ripped out. That's, that's stuff that we should be thinking about, and you're probably never going to get that device rekeyed. It's just probably not going to happen, unfortunately. The cool part is, there are companies that get this. So this is uh, an IoT vendor drop cam, which we'll talk a little bit more uh, in a second. But they, this is their response. Um, you know, and they, technical details, uh, non-technical details, a nice, a nice write-up. But well, this is the kind of stuff that IoT vendors should be doing because guess what? All of these things are connecting to a service. All of them are hitting, hopefully, SSL. And if you're not getting a response like these from your IoT vendors, that's a good time to think, oh, why is one vendor taking this seriously and what is the response to the other vendors? And I, I'm, I'm hoping we get to a point where it's kind of a critical mass where enough vendors are doing the right thing that the other vendors look so bad that when we're on Reddit and Hacker News and Slash, and slash Dot, I was gonna, no one's gonna Slash Dot. Uh, and, sorry, Timothy. And, uh, all these different sites where you're like, oh, what, what camera should I buy? Which of these home automation devices should I buy? You know, we are a consumer reports for ourselves, right? And it's, it's, there's a lot of options on the market, and if you have one that stands out so well like this for a camera, that's probably gonna be your first choice, which is, which is the kind of thing we want people to feel like. So user, and this kind of builds on what Mark was just talking about, about ODMs not actually issuing updates and things of that nature. So users probably don't know, let alone care, um, how to like go through the little WYSIWYG interface to actually update their firmware. Um, and even if they do, it's probably just gonna use Telnet anyway, apparently. Um, and there's, there's, this, this, there's the, this disparity because in, in the mechanisms and flows for actually doing those updates because it might be through the mobile app, it might be through a web interface, it might be you have to plug, uh, you know, uh, the go by the JTAGulator and locate the JTAG headers and you know, do it that way. Um, and really, they just want they just want to use the thing. They just want to they just want to watch you know their, their I don't know watch when their baby's diaper is full or something. They don't care about what version of the firmware it's running. Um, and even if even if there is a mechanism to do it, there's not necessarily a way for users to know that an update is available, that the update didn't take, that the update I don't know didn't check out the you know digest didn't seem to be right. Um, how do you know how do users know that? their device wasn't compromised, that someone didn't pop it open, plug into those UART headers and own everything, and then close and seal it back up. Um, so these are just, those aren't things that people really consider. So I've made a South Park thing, because it's funny. And then finally, um, a lot of these smaller vendors, and again, that's kind of where a lot of this applies, um, and it might apply to a lar larger vendors as well, but it's basically like, 
you know, 1998 to 2001 all over again. They don't understand why anyone would want to lift up their device's skirt and, you know, look at issues, um, or call their baby ugly, and they don't, they don't necessarily know how to respond to that. So they, they get mad, and then they call you with their lawyer, um, and you get this cool keep calm thing that I made, because I make a lot of these images. Um, <laughs> There really aren't any resources out there, guidance for them to, to basically have the kind of education that everyone else, all these other vendors have received over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and, uh, you know, to add insult to injury to any researchers out there, um, because IoT is, IoT is basically like the new mobile, right? It's building all just stacks on stacks on stacks. Um, but it also has this hardware hacking element that people go, that's really cool and neat. And they might be really good hardware hackers, but they don't know anything about security, per se. So they don't know how to report issues. They don't know what the correct format for a vulnerability report is, or the channels to go through. So the nascency of this field means that people who want to do the right thing may not know how. Um, and also, we just really don't want them to get sued or go to the um, you know, federal penitentiary. OK, so how do, we, how do we solve this, guys? You complained a lot. Um, so Mark's going to talk about this thing. Yeah, so, so basically the, the, the redacted part you guys saw in some of the vulnerability stuff, that, that was like the last straw. Like everyone has bad experiences when you report vulnerabilities. That's kind of par for the course. But to the point where we're, we're really not trying to help like the Cisco's of the world do this. Like they have the research teams. They have tons of money. They're OK. They're, they're going to be fine. Uh, when it comes to like the Kickstarter that has $80,000 to do R&D, uh, you know, prototyping, manufacturing, shipping, they're probably not going to drop like 12k on that audit from a really cool firm. It's just not. It's never. It's never going to happen, right? It's just not. So what? What can we do to uh, bring together the stuff that we already want to do, which is research? Bring together the fact that they don't have the the financial backing or maybe the educational resources to do the, the things the right way, and see if we can't, you know, come together and actually solve a little bit of this, uh, at, at least for a couple, couple of products, so that we all know they're safe and then we can use those only. Um, so a couple, a couple areas. So we're going to focus on uh, the crowdfunded, the small commercial, and the bootstrapped vendors. So if you're a large vendor or you work for a large vendor, you know a large vendor, we're not going to deal with them. Not because we don't care. We just, you know, we, there's only so much we can do without making this effort a stupid, uh, you know, um, road to nowhere type, type thing. Uh, partnerships, I think, is really the core part to this. And there's a lot of partners represented in this room that we'll talk about. When these kinds of initiatives start and you start groaning because you realize they're never going to go anywhere, it's because one person is like, oh, I will do it all and this will work out because I know computer and therefore we'll be fine. The, the right way to approach this is how can I get the most smart people together to work together in a iterative enough way that we can actually see progress, snowball a little bit with this and then hopefully other people kind of join in because, hey, they want to. Um, I think OWASP is a good example of that. but. Why we're different from like an OWASP type effort is it's very boutique. We're, we're starting small, we're gonna grow small, and it might not look sexy or exciting because we don't have like a million people on a forum somewhere, but we're actually gonna make an impact and keep iterating until we get to a point where we can control that kind of mass because we don't want it to go out of control and start duping. Yeah, never mind. Um, so uh, incentivization is a huge part of this. We'll talk about that more. Uh, resources, curation. It's not like we have to create new, in some cases we might have some work to do, but in most cases we don't actually have to create new resources. Mobile app security, web app security, embedded device security, firmware security, like these are things that people have already done presentations on. These are things people have written papers on. We need to pull them in one place so that these developers that we can point vendors, you know, say, hey, your, your developers are doing iOS development, here's Apple's iOS security white paper. Um, they're not going to maybe find those and maybe they won't, won't actually bring them down that path if we don't show them. And then presentations, talking to the press, saying, hey, we, we want to make this a little bit better. We want IoT to go the right way. We want to use cool products, but we want to do it in a way that I don't have to end map my, my network every week and hope I don't find something gnarly. So the first phase of this, which we've actually already started, was to basically build a team of, of advisors slash contributors um, to start basically get like the first bit of stuff up on the site. Um, and build all, you know, cool pictures um, like the ones you've seen already with South Park. Uh, and, and basically just be able to transfer knowledge around that group of people and also to the people, um, vendors and researchers who need this information. Um, and also eventually, was just another thing that's kind of in progress is um, forming those relationships with, 
with crowdfunding sites, with IoT vendors, um, with platform providers, and, and anyone else who might be affected or, or you know, affected by or able to provide support for, for this initiative. Um, the second phase um, is basically the rewards and incentivization program. And um, you know, our, our, our partner with, with this phase is BugCrowd. Um, and you know that could be any any number of things. Uh, it could be recognition. It could be monetary reward. It could be you get to keep the device you just owned. It could be um, swag. Uh, it could be any you know all of the above. Um, and, and just to hopefully as part of the first phase, we'll have guided enough people, researchers who want to actually hack on hack on things and you know make a make a fast buck out of it and look cool, um, get their name up on a board. Uh, that phase two will be a nice easy easy transition. Uh, so I think one thing that gets lost when initiatives like these uh, start is what's the progress look like? Where, where have you been going? Where, where, where are you headed? Uh, so February, after we kind of said, hey, let's try to figure this out and, and do something, uh, we talked to BugCrowd really early on. They were in like in a, in a, just in a crazy way that I, I didn't personally expect. They were like, yes, let's do that immediately. I was like, whoa, we, we were just going to get started here and maybe do something soon. So uh, the support they've shown us is, is tremendous. Uh, and we can't thank them enough. Based off of that and based off knowing that we actually had somewhere to go, a road to go down that we, were, we felt good about, uh, we announced at B-Side San Francisco a couple months ago just to say, hey, we're going to do this and a pretty, pretty close version of this deck. So in March to April, we started working on establishing relationships, finding partners, finding vendors, and finding researchers that we uh, believe in, trust, feel like they get, get it, they, they want to be part of this, and they're not cynical, they, they feel like there's going to be a contribution here that's going to be meaningful, um, because we don't, we don't have the time for cynicism right now, unfortunately. Uh, we'll get that later, I'm sure. Uh, crea creation uh, of the website, the first website, if you had the un uh, unfortunate ability to go there, or if you go to archive.org, uh, it was my 1994 special, it was beautiful. And uh, content cur curation, we basically got resources, like I said, the documents, those standards, the white papers, the presentations that we felt covered a nice swath of different areas that are related to IoT vendors. We kind of indexed them, and going forward, uh, we'll actually be kind of creating our own documents and working with partners to get documents from them, and then adding those into the fold to make a little more, I, I think, I I um, IoT specific. The uh, point of coming here today is to tell you about all this, so to catch you up and then also you know, come here and meet with some of the people that we've been working with. May to June, ideally, and you know, times always shift, but we want to start spinning up BugCrowd for our first couple of vendors that are on board. We don't want to like, let this uh, you know, just slow down. We want to keep the momentum going, so that's cool. Uh, vendors and researchers, one thing that we're trying to do, I guess uniquely, is we want the vendors to talk to the researchers. We don't want to say, here's how it's going to work because we're security people. If you want to be part of this, vendors, you should do it this way. We're going to ask them, how do you feel about, like, oh, what do you feel about a research period of 60 days and then a uh, publication period of another 60 days? What do you feel about having these bugs get triaged this way? Uh, we're not looking to tell people how it's going to work. We're, we're asking vendors what's going to work best because if, if we're not willing to adapt to the, the lifestyle of vendors, we're never going to get the steam we need behind this to actually make anything of it. Uh, and then, of course, finding bugs, uh, doing cool stuff, hacking on stuff, rewarding researchers, and solving problems. That's, that's ultimately where we're going. So these are our launch uh, partners. So BugCrowd, we've already talked about. Um, you know, Josh, Josh and the rest of the cavalry folks you know, this is, one, this is one of these projects and initiatives that I really don't think would have been possible because uh, there was such a high level of citizens in InfoSec. We didn't feel like we could be you know, altruistic about anything without kind of like winking after it. Uh, so the stuff that Josh and them have been doing with Cavalry, I think they have a new website up today too. Did I see that? The new website, did it go up? Yeah, so pretty new website, go check it out. A lot of, lot of content there to read through. Um, so the work they've been doing I think is uh, a direct re relationship to this and uh, you know, being a partner I think we'll be going down that road together. Um, Attack IQ, uh, Stefan Chenette in the back uh, was one of our first researchers to say absolutely I get the space, he's doing a lot of other things in IoT uh, and security and helping uh, commercial vendors and, and everyone else get, get involved. Dropcam who you heard about, uh, great vendor, we, uh, we've had some talks with them, they've, they've worked with researchers actually and the Include Security guys had actually done a whole uh, rip of their uh, uh, of their architecture and their device, and I talked to Eric uh, this week, and he's like, yeah, they were the nicest guys in the world, they totally get security, they want to help, they were so excited about the research. Those are the people we need to work with. Those are the people we need to cultivate. Uh, IOActive, Cesar over there, uh, who's the CTO, he's working with us to get things going, and then Postscapes, who we mentioned earlier. 
the people behind one of the sites that track the IoT. They're also involved in things like IoT Day and IoT events and, and just getting like a groundswell of, of people that care about IoT enough that they might also care about uh, you know, the security aspects of it. And then of course Duo because they're providing us you know, the resources and, and uh, artistic talent, not this, this is me. Uh, but like our logo and stuff designed by you know our creative team. That, so those, those .ly domains are not cheap. So no, Duo, not. yeah, Duo Security's been been backing us the whole time, and obviously they get they get infosec as well as anyone. So it's uh, it's been great. So real quick, I know it's zero minutes. And you're gonna give me negative thirty seconds. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, there, this is still like a malleable thing. IoT security is still something we can kind of affect, um, and that's very rare in IT, you know, infosec and IT security anymore. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, but we can really leverage a lot of the stuff we've experienced in the past and not repeat 1998 all over again. Um, so this is also going to be really fun. And uh, finally, uh, there's, I, this was really funny in February when we had like a go-to fail reference. Um, heart bleeds the new hotness, but uh, we left it in there anyway. So uh, with that, um, go to the site, you know, let us know if you're interested and want to help out, and um, I guess questions or whatever. Thanks. Thanks. Anyone with a question? So you alluded. Uh, so you alluded earlier in one instance to questions of cyber physical attacks. Uh, your joke about the uh, kitchen, I think, going up. In general, um, what do you think um, are the possibilities for cyber physical attacks for these types of systems, particularly for home autom automation, and particularly also other new attack surfaces? For instance, a lot of these electrical systems um, run over home wiring. This is something that has never been secured before. Okay, so if you could comment on that. So I think that um, if you, you you can actually look at some of the larger vendors that have had home automation, like um, I guess X10 is still around. Do they still do anything? Um, but vendors like that, and even um, you know the Wem like Belkin Wemo, um, there it's it's been shown that you know software level or, or network level vulnerabilities that you know allow you to flip a thing off and on on the other side is bad. Um, in commenting on like the the probability increased or decreased of that happening for some of these like crowdfunded, you know, no name, you know, basement vendors, um, I think it's probably going to uh, increase initially because as you know, going back to like the Philips Hue and Insteon example, when you are presented with a cheaper option for a thing that achieves what you want it, to, you know, what you're looking to achieve, um, that's probably what you're, gonna, what you're gonna go with. So if you get the fifty dollar uh, automate my entire home and you know allow me to blow up my pool pump um, device over the $150 version um, and you know you don't really think about things like security um, that's you know, you're gonna go with that and I, I, I'm just gonna say it's probably gonna go up the probability not it actually happening but the, 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 the opportunity to blow up someone's pool pump because they went with the Kickstarter version of something um, the home wiring thing I can't really comment on I don't have um, I admit I have like zero experience with that because I'm afraid of electricity. So, um, but that, that is that is an interesting uh, example for sure. It's either good or bad. So content rich. Everything was explained so clearly. We yeah. have no questions. Uh oh, <laughs> I know what he's going to ask. Um. You, you know what I want No, to I don't. Go ahead. No, I was just wondering, if you want to get involved in this, um, is the only way through Buckroad, or can we approach you directly, or what's the way of getting um, there? It de uh, depends on which side you want to go. Um, if it's, you know, the research, like, I want to find things and get rewarded, um, I mean, I, you could certainly go through, through Bug Crowd. Um, you know, once we actually start announcing some of the, the, the bounty programs, or well, I guess the vendors ultimately will be announcing those as a full bug crowd, that would be a good channel. Um, but certainly, I mean, you know, ahead of our next few milestones, reach out to us for sure. Um, and because we, you know, communicate with the bug crowd team, I think fairly regularly, um, you know, we all pass, in, pass people off and pass information off back and forth, so. One more in the back. 
Is there any thought of partnering with somebody like Underwriters Lab to get a seal of, of sorts? Yeah, so some type of rating. One, a great question. Um, one thing that's probably worth saying is we have no desire to make this a, a 5013C, no, no desire to make it an LLC. No so at, at the point of that, making that a reality, we'd have to go through a lot of, uh, go, down, go down a very long road through a lot of bureaucracy likely and put a lot of our time into it we don't have. Uh, why we're partnering and kind of making this such an inclusive process is we want people to leverage their, their talents in a way that we don't have to make this bigger than it is. We want to see results. We want to get vendors in. We want people to hack on it. We want to get bugs fixed and release pu release uh, you know information at, at conferences like this. Uh, if Underwriters Labs you know want, wants to go down that road at some point and they see what we're doing, we might say, hey, we'll we'll be glad to help you know whatever you guys need help with. But we want to keep this small and kind of an intimate thing for the the community. Bring vendors into our community and make it a lot more about um, changing kind of processes than about stamping things, I guess. So, but great question. Thank you. Well, I think that's it. And um, thanks again. You know, shoot us messages on various internet mediums. Thanks. Thanks. Sir.